All right, so welcome everybody. Um, today we're gonna to be talking probably the easiest out of the five this week, uh, a very easy kind of introduction into it. Uh, as we talk about the end, as we talk about this time of trouble, um, I'm not gonna do it like chronologically or, or things like that. Uh, what I really wanna do is, is focus on some key aspects of it. We will get some chronology out of it, uh, but really I wanna focus on the, the big questions that people ask, right? So I know the mark of the beast is a big one. I know, you know, how do the government and the laws and the things that are going on, how does that um, work with what we know is in prophecy, right? The end of the world and things like that. We're going to talk about the environment and nature, uh, which is kind of a, a really big aspect now. Uh, and, and the more it's introduced, uh, we realize just how connected it can be uh, to prophecy. So there'll be a whole day on that. Uh, and then actually, you know, just, just talking about the end itself, right? That, that uh, time of trouble and what that's going to be like, uh, whether we'll suffer and, and, and so on. All right. Today, however, we're going to talk about prophets. Um, and, and this is an important topic because we live in a world now where there's so much information, right? Uh, with the internet, um, everybody has a voice, right? Everybody has an opinion. Um, and prophets in particular are rampant right now. And I'll, I'm going to show you a couple of examples uh, later on. Um, and so a lot of people ask the question, you know, are there prophets at the end? And, and how can I tell the difference? How do we know which ones to listen to uh, and which ones not to? I know in my own personal life, um, growing up in, in church and things like that, a few people have walked into churches, uh, you know, and said, listen, I have a message from God. God spoke to me and, and, and they want to proclaim the message and things like that. Uh, usually, they're kind of run out of the churches, right? Usually they're like, no, nah, no, nah, this isn't for us. You, you know, go, go talk to someone else and things like that. Uh, and so what we're going to do is, okay, let's ask the question, you know, will there be, um, and if there is, how do we know the difference between a real prophet and a false prophet and so on, all right? And we'll have a little bit of history as well. So let me, let me open this up here, uh, the PowerPoint. Um, for some reason, I can't see anybody but hopefully everyone can see me. Let me see here. Um, Just the top yeah. is blocked, Master. The, the top is, is blocked? What, what, there, that's what, better, that's better, that's good, yeah. All right, great. All right, I like to put people's faces up here, perfect. All right, so last day prophets. Let's see what the Bible says. The first question obviously is, um, what is a prophet and why is a prophet? Uh, so that, that's our first big question. So what is the purpose of a prophet? Luckily, the Bible gives us an answer and it's a very easy one. Um, uh, if you're an Adventist, most of these verses you guys are going to know already. Uh, but sometimes there's always something new to learn, right? So Amos chapter three, verse seven says this, uh, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Or in other words, before God does something big, before there's this kind of world-changing or religion-changing event, um, God will always send a prophet, all right? For those who have been joining in, in, in uh, Bronte's Saturday afternoon Bible studies, uh, we actually read this as we're reading, we're reading through the Kings right now. Um, and every time there's a big event about to happen, uh, it's not even just usually one or two, but there's a couple of prophets that pop up, right? And they give that warning. Listen, this is happening. And if you don't change, this is going to happen. Um, so this is the main reason. This is why there's prophets in the Bible. Um, and this is why we listen to prophets because they, they, they appear, God chooses people to give a specific message for a specific time. Um, one thing that we have to realize, and, and I, I know it's, it can be a little bit hard because it's in the word, the word prophet, right? Usually when you hear the word prophet, you kind of automatically, you hear the word prophecy, 
right? Or future telling. Uh, but a prophet isn't restricted to simply talking about the future. Um, the, 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 the foundational idea of what a prophet is isn't fortune telling. It's simply God giving a message to the church or to a nation or to a group of people at a specific time. <coughs> so if you read the Old Testament, for instance, uh, many, many prophets, you know, some whole Bible books are, you know, based on a prophet. In most cases, they're not talking about the future. In most cases, they're talking about the present, you know. Uh, God has given me a message to say, you know, this is happening uh, and we need to change, right? We need to change direction or we got to stop sinning. We got to repent and so on. All right. So when we hear the word prophet, that's, that's what we have to have in our minds. A prophet doesn't have to be a fortune teller, someone that talks about the future. <coughs> a prophet is simply someone who has a message from God. Uh, a, un a unique message for that time, for that people, all right? And so God does nothing without first talking to his servants, the prophets. So that's the reason why prophets exist. Will there be real prophets at the close or at the end of the world? The Bible also very clearly talks about this. So this is found in Acts chapter 2. Uh, and I'll explain this a little bit. This is actually, I believe, Peter talking uh, about his time, um, even though it also talks about our time as well. But let me read it here. So Acts chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in, in the last days, so we know it's talking about the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy, all right? What's interesting is Peter actually uses these, this text, this is actually from the Old Testament, uh, talking about his day. But that's because uh, the disciples very, you know, when, when Jesus first went to heaven, uh, you know, after, after, the, uh, after the resurrection, they truly believed that, that Jesus was gonna come back within months, maximum years, right? Um, and so Peter, you know, knowing his Bible <coughs> and simply assuming that they were living in the last days, uses this, this verse here. Um, but the verse makes it very clear that this is talking about the last days, right? And the Bible is making it very clear that in the last days, uh, there will be prophets, right? There will be people that prophesy, have visions, have dreams, <laughs> and so on. So that gives us um, a very important question. Then, So we know there's going to be prophets. Um, what do we do with that? Right? How do we, how do we <coughs> deal with this information? Let's look at history first. Uh, well, before that, let's read this here. So this is from First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 19 to 21 says this, do not quench the spirit. <coughs> Sorry, I'm coughing all over the place now. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. All right. So the Bible's making it very clear. Listen, don't just automatically reject the prophet. Don't just automatically reject the prophecy. Don't just automatically reject anything that's new, right? Um, because let, let's face it, when it comes to religion, we don't like new things, right? We like things to be the way they are. This is what I was taught as a child. So this is what I want to believe, right? Um, and so the idea that there will be prophets in the end, the idea that there will be prophecies from God uh, scares a lot of people, right? They don't like that idea. They, they, they prefer the idea of this is, you know, the truth. This is what we need to know. And, and that's all I need. I don't need to know anything new. I don't need to learn anything different. Um, I can just go on with my life. But here, Paul is the one that wrote this. He, he's not saying that. He's saying, listen, um, don't despise prophets or, or prophecies. Don't just throw them away without listening to them. We have to test them. All right. Test all things. 
And, and if you see that the, the prophet of the prophecy is good, then hold fast to it, keep it, follow it, right? Uh, take it as the word of God. And so we as Christians, we as individuals, as a church, we have this important job. We need to listen and then test all things and then uh, either accept what is good, reject what is bad. Let me give you a little bit of history here. This is John Huss. He was born in uh, around 1369. Uh, he died in 1412. Uh, he died because he disagreed with the church at the time. All right. Uh, he actually nailed uh, six, I believe it was, um, six ideas on, a, on the door of a church, which then Martin Luther copies later on. Um, when he was being killed, um, they kind of made fun, fun of him because the, the word Hus um, is Bohemian for goose, all right? So, so let me read this here. This is uh, what history tells us. As the official uh, executioner was about to light the, the pyre at the feet of the reformer, so he was burned at the stake, right? He said, now we will cook the goose, right? Making fun of his name, Hus. Um, and there it says, Hus in Bohemian means goose. Yes, replied Hus, but there will come an eagle in a hundred years that you will not reach, all right? Um, and this is his last words. This is literally, you know, the, the last words that he said before he died, um, which ended up being prophetic, all right? So John Hus is one of the original reformers. He's one of the original men who were inspired by God, moved by God, taught by God, uh, who went back into the Bible and was trying to correct errors that the church of the day was having, all right? Uh, and then he gives this prophecy at the end of his life that, you know, uh, in a hundred years, there would be an eagle making fun of that, again, that whole goose eagle thing. There will be a man that they won't be able to stop. There's going to be a man that, that won't be, you know, burned at the stake and so on. That prophetically came true uh, with Martin Luther, all right? Uh, literally, just over a hundred years later, Martin Luther, who was a, a, a huge fan of Huss, uh, and followed all his writings and teachings, and then actually copied him by nailing the, the famous 95 Thesis on the door of the church there in Witt, uh, Wittenberg. A um, hundred years later, he is that eagle. He is this man that um, literally started the Reformation, uh, and unlike us, the goose, uh, Martin Luther was the eagle that they weren't able to stop, right? He kept going. Uh, there's actually another tradition. The, the king of, of Germany there, uh, not a king, one of the lords, um, history tells us, or at least this is what they believe, uh, the, same, the same day that Martin Luther actually nailed the 95 Thesis on the door, uh, this lord had a dream of a man uh, writing on a door, writing a note on, on a Catholic door, uh, and the, the, um, the pen, which was a, a feather, right, in those days, the feather that he was using to write was so large that it knocks off the, the crown of the Pope, right? Um, and when they ask, you know, what, what are you writing here? Uh, he actually said in, in that dream, in that vision, the man that was writing, he said, um, uh, I'm writing with a goose feather, right? Going back to connecting that to Huss. So there's a whole prophetic backstory uh, with Huss and, and Martin Luther. What's interesting, however, is that the, the changes that Martin Luther was able to do and, and the way that he was inspired by God and the messages that he wrote, uh, that the people, the Germans, because that's where he was from, the Germans of, those day, of the day actually considered him a prophet, all right? Uh, his message was so new uh, that a lot of people actually called him the angel of Revelation 14, all right? It's, uh, if you're an Adventist, you'll know that, that chapter really well, right? The three angels' messages. Uh, and they, would, they actually said, you know, Martin Luther was one of those angels because he was guided so much by God. Um, and when he died, they, they said, you know, the the, um, the German prophet or the German Isaiah has been put to rest, 
right? Uh, they, they saw Martin Luther as a prophet. And when you look at his story, he, he really was led by God, right? He had these messages and he really did create the church, which makes sense when you go back to that original verse, right? Where it says that God won't do anything un unless he tells his prophets first. And the Reformation is a huge shift in history, right? You're going from one Christian church to suddenly, you know, the, all these new Christian churches. And so it makes sense that God would, again, have a prophet, not someone that tells the future necessarily, but someone that has a, a specific message from God for a specific people. So Martin Luther actually does fit that bill uh, in terms of, of being a prophet in, in the sense that he had a, a specific message for his day, right? And literally changed the church. The same is said for John Calvin, all right? Um, one of his biggest followers, uh, which was a, a man named Biza, uh, he says that, you know, at Calvin's funeral, uh, the people were shouting, the prophet of the Lord has died. The prophet of the Lord has died. Again, because he had this, such an important message from God, and again, revolutionized the church and moved the church in a new direction. So throughout history, um, people have been called prophets. Um, people have been called, you know, uh, prophets because they receive a, a specific message from God and they share that to the world. Uh, here's a list of, of people that are considered prophets in history. So Joan of Arc, I think most people know her story. So she's a, a Catholic, right? A uh, prophet uh, of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has many prophets, by the way. Uh, Saint Malachi is, is also one of them. He wrote uh, the, the book of the popes or the prophecy of the popes. Uh, William Miller, obviously, the 1840s, uh, it, it was seen as a, as a prophet because, again, he opened up the book of Daniel and, and gave this, this message to the world. Joseph Smith, uh, another famous prophet, right, the, the creator of the, the Mormon church, uh, the Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. Harriet Tubman, so here's someone who's also been called a prophet. She was um, uh, instrumental in freeing slaves. Uh, during that time period, and, and she, uh, when you actually read her story, she constantly communicated with God, and God would send her these messages, uh, which would actually protect her as, as she tried to escape uh, and go north into Canada. Um, so throughout history, you know, there, there's all these people that pop up as prophets. Um, now, the big question, of course, is, well, are they real prophets or are they not, Right. And even within this list, you can probably say yes, no, yes, no to some of these, right? Um, the Adventist Church also has a prophet, all right? Uh, so Ellen White, who was kind of instrumental there at the beginning of, of our church, um, she is regarded as a prophet by the church. She wrote many books uh, in, in, the same, uh, in the same way that, you know, you look at someone like Calvin or, or Martin Luther uh, Huss, uh, a person that was instrumental in very much kind of guiding uh, the church and, and, and bringing in these messages. Um, now, Ellen White also is, is, is credited for actually having prophecies, right, actually talking about the future. Though if you actually read most of her books, if you actually read through her, and there's many of them, uh, the vast majority actually isn't talking about the future. It was talking about current events, about where the church was and where the church needed to be and, and what God thought and, and so on. Um, so again, it very much follows that same tradition of what a prophet is, all right? So here, though, we have the issue. So we have a lot of prophets throughout history, um, some of them famous, some of them not so much, uh, some of them credited as, as real prophets right? And then other ones as fake prophets. And the big question is, you know, how do we tell the difference? Well, but before we answer that, uh, I want to get to our day, all right? Because everyone that I've talked about is kind of in the past, right? All these people have died. Um, the internet, though, as I mentioned in the beginning, is full of prophets. Uh, I just chose two that I found kind of on the top of the list, uh, I, I simply went to YouTube and I simply wrote, God has, has shown me. I wrote down that phrase, God has shown me, uh, and just lists of people, lists of prophecies and people 
claiming, you know, God has spoken to me, he's giving me this message. This is one, this one's uh, very popular. Um, and if you notice, if you look at the days here, it says, you know, one day ago, three days ago, five days ago, nine days ago. So he's, he's someone that, you know, constantly is getting visions from God, right? Constantly getting visions from God uh, and then proclaiming it to the world. One thing that I find really interesting is look at this first one here, right? So it's called uh, God Showed Me This About Christmas. Uh, now, I actually took this page a few days ago, but look at this. In one day, he got 20,000 views. 20,000 people watched his video the same day that he, he, he posted it. All right. So this isn't simply someone who, you know, uh, writes, uh, writes a message on YouTube and is, and is kind of forgotten. Um, a lot of people follow him. If you look down here, you know, 60, 63,000 views, 60,000 views, uh, and so on. Um, this guy has a following. This guy has literally thousands of people who listen to his prophecies. Uh, and you assume if they're listening, they probably believe, right? Um, so, you know, the, the lowest that I saw here is uh, over here, 13,000 views. So at a minimum, you're looking at about 13,000 people who probably follow this young man, you know? And when he says God has spoken to him, they believe it, you know, and they listen to what he said. And he talks about everything. He talks about politics. He talks about religion. He talks about festivals. Literally, the, if you scroll through it, you'll find everything here. Very similar to the young, this young lady. Uh, and again, if you look at the dates here, one day ago, two days, three days, three days, four days. Uh, so sometimes multiple times a day. So look at this, five days, five days, five days, uh, six days. So she's posting three different prophecies in one day. Um, and again, look at the numbers. In one day, 10,000 views, 10,000 people uh, following this young lady uh, and her prophecies and what God is telling her, right? So hopefully, um, and I'm just giving these two as an example, but hopefully it shows you just how prevalent this is, you know, just how much people are looking for guidance, right? We are living in a world where truth is scarce, right? Uh, you know, the, the big word nowadays is fake, fake news or fake truth, right? Or truth is relative or, you know, there's this very strong belief um, that, you know, there's nothing that's completely true. Uh, and so there's people that are looking and they, and they seek out these prophets. They seek out people who can guide them, who can teach them, who can tell them what's right and wrong and, and, and how to celebrate or how to worry about tomorrow and, and all of these different ideas. Um, and there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of these internet prophets, right? YouTube prophets um, with followers, with big followings. So the, this last part is really the important aspect. Um, how to tell the difference between real and fake prophets. All right. So again, this is uh, a very traditional Bible study. I decided not even to change it. So some of you might have already done a study like this. Uh, but I, I just figure, you know, it's important enough that uh, to go over it. Right. Because um, even if you're an Adventist, we can be swayed, right? We can be following something wrong. Uh, a very unfortunate example that I can give, and it relates very closely to Adventism, is someone like David Koresh, right? So uh, the older people will know who this is, right? David Koresh was uh, a prophet uh, who actually came out of the Adventist church. He was, you know, an Adventist uh, in his lifetime before, you know, becoming a prophet in that. Uh, but he was kind of excommunicated out of the church. But um, he first he said that he was a prophet. Then he claimed to be Jesus himself. Um, and you might remember Waco, Texas, right, where there was the showdown where him and his followers were there. Uh, and, you know, they were armed and then they, they, and they ended up killing each other and stuff like that. Or they, I think they drank Kool-Aid, I think, that had poison in it. Um, 
But a lot of people in that compound, a lot of people that were following Koresh, who truly believed in this prophet, in this man who then claimed to be Jesus, were Seventh-day Adventists or ex-Seventh-day Adventists, right? These were people that, you know, studied the prophecies, that, that knew their Bibles, and yet fell to that fake prophet, right? Fell to that, to that lie. Uh, and so it is important. It's important to, um, to test the prophets, right? To test, you know, what, what are the ways that we can tell whether someone is true or not? So this is the first one, uh, probably one of the, I would say probably the most important out of, uh, out of I think there's four that we're going to read here today. So this is found in Isaiah chapter 8, uh, and I'm going to read verses 19 to 20. At the end, by the way, I am going to open it up for questions. Uh, I just want to make sure I get through everything first. So feel free to, you know, write down some questions. You can ask me at the end there, okay? So Isaiah 8 says this, uh, and when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? So Isaiah is actually specifically talking about this, right? How do we know what God wants from us, right? How do, how do we know um, what the truth is? Uh, and a lot of people say, you know, go to a medium, go to a wizard, go to those that whisper, those that talk to the dead, right? Um, I know even within my own extended family, uh, there's people that go to mediums. There's people that go to, you know, fortune tellers and things like that. Um, and they believe. They believe in what they're told, right? They, they go, they pay their money, they're given uh, something, and, and they believe in it. And they live their life based on what this medium is saying, right? Um, and so, so Isaiah is talking about this. And verse 20 is the important verse here. Let me read it here. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, all right? Uh, or in other words, what this is saying is, if a prophet does appear, or if someone's claiming to be a prophet, if someone has a prophecy from God, a message from God, because it's coming from God, and God does not change, and God has one message, you know, everything goes through the Holy Spirit, God will not contradict himself, all right? That's really what Isaiah is saying here. If, if, uh, if someone claiming to be a prophet arrives and he gives a message from God, but that message is contrary or different than what the Bible as a whole teaches, you know, the law and the testimony, the word of God, if it's different from the word of God, Isaiah is saying that there's no light in them, that they're false prophets, that they're false messages. So this is vital, all right? This is probably the most important out of the four. Um, a lot of people claim the Bible contradicts itself. It really doesn't. If you read it carefully and you, you understand the context and the culture and, 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 and why things are written the way it is, you realize that the, God, the, that the Bible is perfectly in harmony, perfectly united. Um, and any prophet that would come after the Bible would follow in that unity and would follow in that, that cohesiveness of message. All right. So that's the easiest way. Any, if any prophet shows up uh, and, and contradicts. So for instance, um, you know, the, the second commandment says, don't make an idol, right? Don't make an idol of, of any God. If a prophet shows up and says, you know, God showed me that, that we should create an idol, that we should make a statue to worship. That's very clearly false, right? Because he's, he's going against what the Bible is teaching. Um, now, obviously, in most cases, it won't be so obvious like that. Uh, and that's why it says, you know, we got to test and really study. And, and, and one of the best ways, uh, I'll use the examples of banks. Um, so banks obviously have to deal with fake currency, right? Fake bills. Um, they don't show the tellers fake bills. They don't say this is a fake one. This is a fake one. This is a fake one. What they tell the tellers this, listen, here's a real bill. Study it. Know it. Know it backwards and, and, and forwards. Make sure that when you get a real bill, you know it's a real bill. Because if you know what is real, you'll automatically know what's fake. Uh, and, and, and I would suggest the Bible is the same way. Um, the more you know the Bible, the more you know the word of God, the easier it will be to know a fake message, a false prophecy. Um, so 
the importance of studying the Bible, the importance of really knowing your Bible well, is probably the, the number one thing to know the difference between a real prophet and, and a fake one. Let's read the second one. The second one is two slides. This is found in 1 John chapter 4. Uh, and it begins like this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are, uh, uh, whether they are of God. You can see how that is perfectly in harmony with the last verses that we read right uh don't don't you know don't just reject them but test the prophets because many false prophets have gone out into the world all right so this is important to know there are a lot of false prophets in fact i would easily suggest to you that there's a lot more false prophets than real prophets um because let's face it it's a lot easier to be a fake prophet right anyone that has any idea you know, maybe they had a, a a bad burrito and they have a bad dream and suddenly they think it's God, right? And they start posting that on, on YouTube. Um, it can happen, right? It, it's, it's not that hard. Um, so you're going to find a lot more false prophets than real prophets. Uh, but again, the idea isn't just to reject everything. Everyone, anyone that claims to be a prophet, no, we're just going to throw that out. No, it says, test them, test the spirits to see if they're true or not. The verse continues in verse two. Look at what it says here. And this will be our second point. By this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. All right. Um, so one of the things that's that's vital is Jesus. Um, and, and when it says that Jesus has come in the flesh, what that actually says is the entire gospel story, right? So Jesus, the son of God came down in a human form, right? In the flesh form. And, and when it says that, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, it, it automatically means everything that he did while he was in the flesh, right? So his miracles, his teachings, his lessons, and of course, his sacrifice. Um, if, if, if there's a prophet that contradicts or that doesn't believe in the gospel, in the story of Christ, in the literal story of Christ, um, John is saying you, that's the a very clear sign that it's a false prophet, all right? Uh, because Jesus is the son of God. Right, God is never going to send a message that's going to put down Jesus, that's going to reject what Jesus did on earth. Right, uh, the Father and the Son, they do everything together. So, God will never send a message that contradicts or that goes against Christ and what He did here on earth. All right, so a real prophet will completely agree with the Gospels, will completely agree with what Jesus did while he was here on earth, all right? So has to agree with the Bible and has to agree with Jesus Christ, the testimony of Jesus Christ, the story of Jesus Christ. That's the second one. Let's read the third one here. This is found in Matthew. This is actually Jesus himself speaking here. This is verses 15 and 16. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And we'll get into that in a second. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Um, so this is a really important one. A prophet will follow the, the character or the character or the lifestyle of God, right? Um, they will live a life that's worthy uh, a Christian, right? Um, that's why it says, you know, uh, and, and, and you, you might not know this right away. That's where verse 15 comes in. You might see someone and they might seem like good Christians, right? But this is why Jesus is saying, listen, they might on the outside, they might look like sheep, right? But it's what's on the inside that you really have to keep an eye on, right? What's in their heart? What's in their character? What's, it, what's their motivation for doing what they're doing? 
Um, and this is why they could be wolves inside, right? So knowing them by their fruits, it, it's not simply, um, you know, someone comes to church and they say some nice words and they, you know, they, they help someone or whatever. Okay, no, this is a good person. No, that's still very, you're still looking at the outside of the person, you know? Um, Jesus is saying, you know, you have to take some time. Again, study, test, right? Uh, and slowly start seeing their character, start seeing their fruits, start seeing why they do what they do. Um, because, you know, at some point, their, their true colors will, will come forward, all right? Now, that doesn't mean that prophets are perfect, all right? Uh, prophets are human beings, which means prophets will, you know, make mistakes, you know, not be perfect. Um, we can use some examples in history. For instance, Martin Luther, right? So here's this man that literally revolutionized the church, created the Reformation, um, but he could swear with the best of them. He was worse than a sailor, you know, and, um, you know, he could out drink anybody. Um, so he wasn't perfect by any means, right? Uh, but especially for his time and what was accepted in those days, what the, the truth that was given in those days, um, he, he did live the best life that he could, right? Uh, and so it, it's, it's important to have that balance. Don't think that they have to be perfect to be a prophet, but at the same time, you have to know their heart, you know? Are they doing this just for power, just to get rich, just to control. If those are the motivations, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, but if it's someone that you know truly wants to help people, to bring people to Christ and so on, um, and, and tries to live a lifestyle that, that God teaches, uh, then that's, that's something that you, know, you can take, all right? So that's the first, uh, that's the third one. So the first one, has to agree with the Bible. Second one has to uh, believe in Christ and the, and the gospel, the story of Christ. The third one is their motivation, their character, who they are underneath uh, should be a Christian, right? Should be someone that follows the same character of Christ, even though they might not be perfect 100%, right? And finally, number four, I believe this is the last one. Uh, I'll find out in a slide from now. This is found in Jeremiah 28, verses 8 to 9. Now, this one uh, is specifically about when they talk about the future, right? Now, again, not all prophets will, right? Some prophets are simply, God has given me a message for today, for the church or for whatever. Um, but if they do give a prophecy, right, if they do... Uh, talk about the future. For instance, I'll give you a quick example, and I wish I could find the video, but I think they were all erased. Uh, but maybe three or four years ago, uh, there was a prophet in Toronto, in Ontario, uh, an Adventist man who, who was this prophet, and he started going on YouTube claiming that Toronto was going to be flooded, that it was literally going to become a lake, right? That this natural disaster was going to happen. He gave a date for it. I think it was sometime in September or something. Um, and it spread like brush fire, you know, they, they, everyone was watching these videos this guy was doing. But of course, September came and September went and there was no flood. Uh, and, and quickly those, those, those videos were taken down. So that's a very clear sign. You know, he gave a prophecy about the future and was very specific about it and nothing happened. Um, so let me read this here. Uh, it went, when something like that happens. The prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Or in other words, if the prophet gives a, a prophecy of the future and it doesn't happen, then they're not a prophet. It's as simple as that, right? Uh, this, this one's pretty easy. Um, now, again, uh, sometimes they'll skirt around it and give excuses and things like that. Uh, but in general, you know, this is a very simple rule. If they're making prophecies about the future and they don't come true, um, don't bother listening to them. I, th this comes up every single time, you know, the, the, the World Cup comes around of soccer. 
uh, on the Portuguese radio station. I don't know why they do this, but every time the soccer comes around, they bring in a, um, a fortune teller. And every World Cup, the fortune teller says, no, Portugal is going to win it this year. They have never been right to this day, all right? Um, you would think at some point they would stop inviting these fortune tellers who keep getting it wrong. Um, but <laughs> I don't know. I guess they're hoping that one day they get it right. Um, but, but that's... <laughs> Michael just popped in just to give me a thumbs up for that one. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that's a very simple one. If, if they're giving a prophecy, you know, and it doesn't come true, then there's your answer, right? And, and the Bible is making very clear of that. Um, so those are the four things to remember. Uh, and, and really out of everything that I, I said today, those are the four things that I really want you to remember. A prophet will always agree with the Bible because it's coming from the same God, the same Holy Spirit. God will never contradict himself, all right? The prophet will have to agree with Jesus in the story and the gospels because Jesus is the son of God and, and God will never go against his son. We'll never talk bad about his son. We'll never reject what his son did here on earth. So a true prophet will always agree with Jesus Christ and the gospels. Uh, the third one, which I'm forgetting right now, can someone remind me? Anyone paying attention? What's the third one? They will... Motivation. Say it again, Shirley. Motivation. That's right. Uh, you'll know them by their fruits. Hey, yes, I, Shirley, you're paying attention. Hey. <laughs> um, yeah, you'll know them by their fruits, right? Um, and, and unfortunately, again, someone like David Koresh, you know, and, and there's other prophets around who a lot of times their only motivation is power to sleep with women, right? Most of these guys, you know, have a harem by the end of it. You know, the, there's always these negative things attached, right? Um, and a true prophet won't be like that. A true prophet, again, not perfect, but they'll try to follow the, the commandments of God, right? They'll do their best to live a godly life, a Christian life. Uh, and if you see someone who might be saying nice things, but their lifestyle is completely backwards to that, that the Bible teaches, that God teaches, then they're not a real prophet. You know, God, God chooses those that, that follow his will, right? Uh, and then, of course, the fourth one, the easiest one, is if they make a prophecy and it doesn't come true, move on, right? Uh, you, you don't have to spend time, time with that, all right? So those are the, the four things. Um, more and more prophets are going to be coming, popping up, right? Uh, and you've probably already run into a few of them, you know, especially with the internet, you know, between YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and all of those things. You know, these, these people come around giving these prophecies and ideas and visions and dreams. And uh, so remember those four guidelines and, um, and God will, will be with you and he'll direct you as to what is true and what isn't. All right. Tomorrow. So today was, was an easy one. Tomorrow is where we're really going to go knee deep. Uh, we're going to talk about the mark of the beast, what it is, where it comes from, uh, who makes it. Uh, and the purpose behind it, all right? Uh, when we study that tomorrow, it's going to open up the door to all the other days, because then we're going to focus specifically on different groups that are connected to the mark of the beast. So for instance, governments and unions and things like that, we're going to talk about the environment and nature and, and what's happening in the world on that side of things. Um, and then, of course, we'll talk about the actual end, all right? Um, I'm going to open this up now in case anyone has any questions, because I do want to have some time. We have uh, about eight minutes. Um, so does anybody have any questions, anything that was confusing or anything that you want more information on? Uh, feel free. Feel free to take it off mute. I think everyone can do that. Um, and ask away. Anybody? Anybody? Today's maybe is easy. I think tomorrow's is where a lot of the questions are gonna are gonna start popping up. Dad, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just wanted to not ask a question, but make a comment. Um, our, our sister White, uh, she does uh, she does comment on 
on the when on the days of uh, what's it called uh, when you have to flee from from wherever you're living. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That uh, she does say that you will uh, some people will have actually visions dreams to direct them now it's time to go yeah. leave this place yeah and there's going to be angels also uh, as directing humans the directing the people yeah. so this is going to happen yes yeah so i and i can explain that a little bit so in the bible especially in the new testament in the old testament as well actually uh, there's something that they call the early rain and the latter rain, all right? So the early rain was Pentecost. The early rain was the beginning of the church. So you'll know that story from the book of Acts where, you know, the rain falls upon the apostles and, you know, there's just explosion from the church, right? If you read through the book of Acts, it's full of prophets, you know, prophets prophesying. It's full of miracles. It's full of just these magnificent, wonderful things things right and the church grows rapidly because of that um after the apostles it, it very much cools down right that that doesn't continue uh god did that you know on purpose because he was kind of uh jump starting the church if you want to put it that way right so he really wanted to prove no this is real you know this christianity isn't just something that people made up it was backed up by god right through miracles through, through things like that. In the book of Acts, um, you know, every church had prophets. You know, there's families where all the daughters were prophets and would have the, and again, these prophecies in general would be, you know, how to direct the church and what God wants and so on. A few of them would talk about the future. Uh, but in general, it was that, that foundational prophet, which is this is what God, this is what God is telling us to do. This is the direction that we should move in. Um, so the early church, had a very strong outpouring of the Holy Spirit, including prophets, including these messages from God. When you read through Revelation and, and parts of the New Testament, um, it, it makes it very clear that there's going to be a latter rain or a second outpouring, which will then again fall upon the church, fall upon the Christians, true followers of God. And very similar to like the book of Acts, there's going to be this revival of miracles and just God working on the world and prophets, like, like my dad suggested, right? We know there's going to be a time when uh, we'll have to run and, and, and leave, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the government aspect and even the mark of the beast. Um, and, and yes, a God, in the same way God directed Elijah and fed Elijah, you know, with the ravens and things like that. Uh, God will be doing the same thing, right? Jesus actually talks about the, the day that we, you know, the, the day is going to come, we'll have to run away into the mountains and so on. Um, but God will not leave, lead us or leave us. Um, there will be that outpouring, that latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which will include messages from God, right? People will receive messages in terms of, of how to move. Um, very reminiscent, very similar to someone, like I mentioned, Harriet Tubman. If you, if you read her story, um, you know, there, there was times where she would be traveling, you know, with a, a group of, of freed slaves um, and God would direct her, you know, don't go this way, go that way, you know, and, and even though it, she had the path, you know, set, she would know God told me to go this way and they would go and then later on find out that there was men waiting for her. Right. Uh, and so in that, in a very similar way, you know, the Bible's teaching us that as we get to the end, uh, that God will work in the same way. He'll be guiding us, you know, and, and we'll have that protection from God. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions or comments? Hi, Pastor. Good night. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's so many, so many, uh, there's so much controversy over Sister White within the church. How can we, as, as Seventh-day Adventists in these last days, truly appreciate the messages that were sent? And because there's a lot of people that, that they'll speak and say, well, you know, well, it wasn't really from God and this. So as a Seventh-day Adventist, yeah. what, what can you suggest for us as, 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 as believers? Well, um, yes, yeah, so this, this is what's interesting with that. Um, and it's true, there's a lot, you know, especially the newer generation, uh, based on statistics from the world church, um, in general, 
the Adventist memberships are reading less. Um, and that includes the Bible as well. So we used to read the Bible a lot more in general. Uh, but every generation, we seem to be reading it a little bit less and a little bit less. Uh, and that includes Ellen White, right? So, uh, and, and in fact, Ellen White is a much larger percentage. So it's dropping a lot faster uh, than, than studying the Bible. Um, he, here's the interesting thing. So yes, there's a lot of people that, you know, they're like, well, I don't know if I believe in Ellen White. It was a long time ago. And she says a few things that I don't agree with and things like that. Um, but what's interesting is most are already benefiting from her prophecies, even if they don't read it, right? Because uh, a lot of her teachings have, you know, found their way embedded into the church, right? So just by being a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, and, and following uh, the teachings of the church and so on, uh, even though you might not be reading Ellen White, uh, to a certain degree, you're still following a lot of her teachings in that, right? Uh, the good news is there's nothing that Ellen White teaches that the Bible also doesn't teach, right? Uh, she, she has a famous uh, quote where she says, if people knew how to read the Bible properly, God would never have sent me, right? Like my purpose is to bring people to the Bible. That's, that's, my, that's my main purpose. Um, and so as long as we're doing that, uh, we can still benefit, right? But the main thing that I would suggest, honestly, is... Just try reading her, right? A, a, a lot of times people that say they don't believe in Ellen White have never actually read anything from her. Uh, you know, if try reading something and, you know, pray about it and see what happens. You're either going to be, you know, inspired or you won't. Um, and, but, you'll, you know, rejecting something before you even know about it, you know, it's kind of a cop out. Uh, at least give it a try, right? At least try reading something and, and see what you think. Judy, go ahead. I know you had your hand up. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, when I first became an Adventist, um, everything was Ellen White said, and Ellen White said, yeah, and Ellen yeah, White yeah. said. Um, and this is where we have to be careful now. I, I have since found out uh, who she is and what her writings are. But at that time, I didn't want to hear about, I wanted to find out what the Bible said. Absolutely. And so we were putting Ellen White as far as I was concerned, we were putting Ellen White above the Bible. Mm -hmm. Ellen White said, Ellen White said, not what the Bible said. So yeah. that's all I have to say. And, and the reason that happens, it, to be honest, is laziness. Um, because it is easier to read Ellen White, you know, than, than to have to struggle and study the Bible. She's a lot more straightforward, right? She just says, listen, this is what the Bible was saying, right? This is, the, this is what it meant. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But to be honest, and that's why, so for instance, when I do Bible studies, I use the Bible. It's, it's called a Bible study for a reason, right? Uh, yeah. The word Bible is in there. Um, now, now, that doesn't mean that I don't read Ellen White. I do. You know, I'll read her, but I, I always use her more as a, um, a sounding board or a confirmation to what I'm reading in the Bible. The Bible always has to come first right? The, the Bible and what the Bible teaches always has to come first. Um, she says that herself, right? The Bible is the greater light. I'm just the lesser light. I'm, I'm here to lead people to the Bible. Um, so I, I think you're right, Judy. I think, you know, there was a time, and you know what? I don't even think it's a time. I think it really depends on the group and the church and, uh, you know, the, the background. Um, there are some people that really do uh, I mean, I know people that they'll quote Ellen White a hundred times before they quote the Bible once, yeah. and then they'll go back to quoting Ellen White a hundred. And for me, that's dangerous. For me, that's, that's, it's unbalanced, right? Um, you should always be quoting the Bible more than Ellen White, right? That's the primary source. That's the, the, the bigger light. That doesn't mean you don't read Ellen White. That doesn't mean you don't get inspiration from her. Uh, but for instance, the, I'll, I'll use the, the Adventist church as an example. The Adventist church, all of our doctrines, all of our core beliefs are based on the Bible. And that's important, right? We don't base our beliefs on something that Ellen White says. Now, she might agree with them, but 
are, so if you actually go through and, and look at the, our, our fundamental beliefs, uh, it'll be full of scriptures. It'll be full of, you know, we believe this because the Bible says this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. Uh, and that's how it has to be. You know, the Bible at the end still has to be our primary source, has to be the main fountain of, of truth and knowledge, um, which is why it says, you know, the prophet has to agree with the Bible because the yeah. Bible has to be the foundation. The Bible has to be our core. Any, anyone else, any, any questions or comments? Okay, well, I don't want to leave. Um, uh, we're already at 8.33. I promised it would be an hour. So uh, I think that we're going to end it here. Let me just stop recording.